Welcome to Human Monsters. Marcel André Henri Félix Petiot was born on January 17, 1897, in Auxerre, Ion, France. His parents were Félix Irani Mustioli Petiot, and his mother was Marta Marie Constance Josephine Bourdon. It was their wish to have a son, and they showered all the affection and material comfort they could muster onto him. Marcel was remembered as an intelligent and precocious child, a fast learner, and insatiably curious. This was apparent to his school teachers, but he was also noted for being a disruptive presence in the classroom. Not only did he not recognize the authority the teachers had over him, but he would talk over them and challenge them constantly. He didn't even consider them peers. He felt he was born knowing more than them, despite his comparably limited life experience. Soon they overlooked his intellectual gifts and saw him only as a recalcitrant troublemaker. On some occasions, he would argue with the teacher for as long as a week. As a result, he was suspended from school on many occasions. Neither of Marcel's parents knew what to do about his behavior. Discipline didn't work, and they couldn't kill his undesirable traits with kindness. He would be compliant and mild-mannered following a suspension, but it was always temporary. His peers found his rebellious conduct amusing. They didn't find his other behaviors endearing, however. He wasn't a bully, but he did exhibit a complete lack of regard for the thoughts, feelings, and opinions of his peers. He was a law unto himself. He was headstrong, doing whatever he wanted to do, whenever he wanted to do it. He followed his self-styled moral code and adhered to it as steadfastly as if it were the official law of the land. Anybody who contradicted him was perceived as a scoff law. It wasn't easy to play childhood games with someone who was so inflexible and one-sided. A grandiose feeling of entitlement factored into his world view. If he felt something he didn't own rightly belonged to him, he would demand it from the owner or command someone to steal it from him. If they neglected to do either, he would be quite cross with them. His precociousness was not endemic only to his childhood. As his knowledge base and vocabulary expanded, he grew older and viewed his contemporaries as inferior and adults as peers. Marcel Petiot also became fixated on adult pleasures. For instance, when he was 11 years old, he brought a female classmate to an isolated area and tried to force her into sex. She was ignorant of the ways of coitus and was baffled by his proposition. She had never conceived of the possibility that he would want to remove her clothes and touch her in areas her parents told her should not be touched by strangers. A teacher intervened before Marcel could bring the encounter to fruition. The girl was deeply upset and told her parents what happened. When her parents confronted school administrators, they doubt and played it as typical childhood curiosity. Marcel Petiot was suspended for that stunt. The principal and teachers were so shocked and appalled by what he had done that eventually the suspension was overruled and Petiot was expelled permanently. His mother homeschooled him. He was briefly enrolled in other schools, but he routinely ran afoul of their rules and was soon expelled. He passed out pornographic photos at one school. At another, he propositioned a male student for sex in a very similar fashion he had with the girl. He reenacted a circus performance by having a male classmate stand against the door so Marcel could throw knives at him. He was a good throw. He never landed a blade, but came dangerously close. He was outraged that he was expelled despite not having injured the boy. The damage was done to the door, but it was enough. The Petio family welcomed a new child, a boy named Maurice. He was not as bright as Marcel, but he was easygoing and compliant, much to his parents' relief. In 1912, Marcel's mother, Marta, died suddenly of the Spanish flu. Her death was devastating to the entire family. Felix moved to the town of Joigny, leaving Maurice and Marcel in the care of an aunt. The long-range plan was that at the end of the school year, the boys would join him in Joigny. The impact of Marta's death was observed in Marcel's disposition, which had changed considerably. He was quiet and introverted, 
very much out of character for him. Ironically, it was Maurice who became a problem to their aunt, as he was so unsettled by his mother's death that he was greatly unhinged by the experience and became emotionally unstable. Eventually, Marcel kicked his way out of his self-imposed hermetic shell as a growing anger raged inside of him. He felt abandoned by both parents, and his resentment, qualified or not, demanded a scapegoat. The situation had left him feeling helpless. He sought the power of blame to bring him back in tandem with humanity after being cast out to the hinterlands of society, a place where boys who have lost their mothers watch their families disintegrate as they stand flat-footed and devoid of a way to intervene. In the absence of strength, he was galvanized by rage, and he frequently lashed out at others. He was expelled from school yet again, so the adjustment to a life without his mother would require more time. Marcel was sent to live with his father while Maurice stayed with their aunt to finish the school year. Felix made it clear to Marcel that he was disappointed in his conduct. This angered Marcel because he felt he was wrong to feel that way. Felix's attempts to discipline Marcel only fueled his resentment and hatred. Felix got Marcel enrolled in a local school, but he was expelled after only a few months due to restlessness and rebellious behavior. Marcel had other plans. He had begun a career as a criminal. He started by stealing from local businesses. He soon advanced to breaking into mailboxes and stealing the contents. He was careless as he discarded the letters, and police followed the trail right up to his father's apartment. Marcel was arrested for destruction of public property. March 1914. A doctor evaluated Marcel's mental health at the time of his trial. In his report, he referred to Marcel as, quote, an abnormal youth suffering from personal and hereditary problems which limit to a large degree his responsibility for his acts. A panel of doctors reported their findings regarding Marcel Petiot's mental health to the court. The judge pronounced, The accused appears to be mentally ill. The charges were dropped, and Marcel was returned to the custody of his long-suffering father. At this point, Maurice had joined the two men, and Felix far preferred his company to Marcel's. The solution Felix opted for was to send Marcel to a specialist academy in Paris. This boarding school was more institutional than the public schools. In fact, it was more like a reform school than a typical secondary educational institution. Now that Marcel was in an environment where nobody was prepared to put up with this garbage, he finally applied himself to his studies in a serious manner. It was the only way to leave the school before adulthood. With his behavioral problems swept aside, he graduated at the top of his class. His application to any university was as good as approved, should he have wished to pursue higher education. He didn't. He was sick of being shackled to an institution and he cherished his newfound freedom. This freedom was short-lived. In January 1916, he received a letter from the government. He was being drafted into the military. The Germans were advancing from the West, and Marcel Petiot was shipped out alongside his brothers-in-arms to fight back. Though the French military was ill-equipped compared to the Third Reich's war machine, Marcel Petiot was a top-tier soldier, fighting effectually as a crack marksman and a valiant warrior on the field, going toe-to-toe -to -toe when necessary. He was fearless and thirsted for his enemy's blood. His psychotic hatred of the Germans fueled his aggression, and he was an inspiration for any soldier in his battalion who may have felt daunted. He was a monster when his country needed one. Still, he was not indestructible. When he was struck by a shrapnel, he was indisposed in medical care for a time. Against doctor's orders, he returned to the battlefield. The same rebel spirit that got him kicked out of school refused to acknowledge a German soldier as his superior or even his peer. To him, they were vermin to be exterminated, and even with his injury causing him considerable pain, he refused to back down. He wasn't the most well-liked soldier among his ranks for vintage Marcel Petiot reasons, but he earned their respect when he boosted morale with his inexhaustible resolve and resilience. 
The Germans were forced into retreat and were resigned to lean on their last resort, toxic gas. They released several canisters. The French soldiers were equipped with gas masks, but perhaps seeing them as a sign of weakness, Petiot refused to wear his. In fact, he defiantly took a large breath of the chlorine gas as if it were a fine cigar. Next thing Marcel Petiot knew, he woke up in hospital. The shrapnel resisted extraction. The gas damaged his lungs to such a degree it hurt to take a breath. But it wasn't the pain of the impact on his body that hurt the most. It was that the Germans advanced after unleashing the gas and claimed the territory. Petio hated languishing in the hospital while the war was still being fought. He was dying to get back in the shit and slaughter some Germans. A young Adolf Hitler fought in World War I with the Germans. If only Marcel Petio had caught up with him. Marcel Petio's mental health was greatly discomposed after his time on the battlefield. Doctors wondered if these symptoms were congenital or the product of shell shock. He fell back into his habit of committing petty crimes during his stay in the hospital. At first, he stole and hoarded blankets. Eventually, he got a hold of morphine and the required paraphernalia for injection. Before long, he was an addict. Like a typical junkie, he was prepared to do anything to get his fix. Wallets were stolen from patients and staff alike. He would even steal watches, cufflinks, and jewelry when he could for resale on the black market. Strangely, he progressed beyond stealing material items for their monetary value. He began stealing photos of soldiers' girlfriends and wives. He would even steal letters sent to them from anxious relatives. Stealing from the military was a major offense in France, and Petio was transferred from a hospice to the Orleans jail. The loss of his freedom was infuriating for him. Once Petio finished his sentence, he was brought before tribunal to determine whether he was fit for redeployment to the war. The French war effort was not holding up well in his absence, and though there was no question that the man was bonkers, he was exactly the kind of cold-blooded killer you need on the front lines. He was sent back to fight for his country. The decision of the French government to put Petio in prison left him feeling betrayed. When he returned to the battlefield, he had no intentions of obeying orders. He considered his own judgment to be superior to that of his commanding officers, even if they were more experienced. Some things never change. One thing was for sure, he was not going to die for his country that, as he saw it, had double-crossed him. He didn't hesitate to kill German soldiers, though. It had less to do with patriotism than it did with self-preservation. He decided he would rather spend the rest of the war in a hospice, high on morphine. To accomplish this, he shot himself in the foot. Literally. He could see daylight through the other side of his foot. Doctors knew the wound was self-inflicted and the knowledge of his self-destruction did not exactly endear him to his fellow servicemen. However, he had other health issues that were more a product of conflict. Symptoms common with shell shock emerged, such as amnesia, suicidal tendencies, sleepwalking, and depression. The last thing this guy needed was more mental illness. Marcel Petiot was discharged with a disability pension. This time around, the French forces were more than happy to wipe their hands of him. Petio was smiling all the way to the bank. The officers who escorted him to freedom were disgusted. The way they saw it, he had disgraced himself as a soldier. He put himself before his country. To be surprised by that was to be ignorant of the true nature of Marcel Petio. Marcel Petiot didn't spend his post-war years rotting in an apartment blissed out on morphine. For a change, he endeavored to serve his fellow man. He decided to become a doctor. There was an accelerated education program for veterans, and he took full advantage. He became passionate about his studies and achieved the highest marks among the segment of the student body with which he was in competition. He finished medical school in eight months. Following this, he served a two-year psychiatric internship 
at Evreux. Had one been able to tap into Marcel Petiot's brain, they would have discovered the self-serving reasons for his decision to practice medicine. Access to narcotics. According to AddictionCenter.com, one in ten physicians will become addicted to drugs or alcohol at some point in their lives. The general population yields drug addicts at about the same rate. One thing Marcel Petio always despised was a scenario in which somebody had power over him. Doctors were not exceptional in that regard. He loved the idea that he could turn those tables and be the one who would hold the power to heal or kill in his hands. December 15, 1921. The Faculté de Médecine de Paris granted Marcel Petio his full medical degree. He was free to practice medicine anywhere in France. Still not motivated by the need to alleviate the suffering of his fellow man, Dr. Petio wished to avoid the typical plight of the family doctor. It struck him as boring and did not guarantee the financial payoffs he wished for. He also wanted as much status as a medical degree can confer upon a man. He would brag to anybody who was too polite to walk away that he was a doctor. Despite the financial security he was sure to attain by practicing, he remained a kleptomaniac. Everywhere he went, he would steal things, even items that did not command a high payday. He also intended to hoard as much money as he could. As a freelance doctor making house calls, he would never make as much money as he wanted. He finally decided to establish his own practice. He set up shop in the township of villeneuve sur yon Petio was competitive, and he set his sights on eliminating the practices that had been operating for years before his arrival. He was 25, while the other doctors were in their 80s. Petio had flyers printed that advertised his surgical practice. The ad copy went as follows. Dr. Petio is young, and only a young doctor can keep up to date on the latest methods born of a progress which marches with giant strides. This is why intelligent patients have confidence in him. This was the early 20th century, so he was able to get away with such blatant ageism. It worked. Marcel Petio became a busy and highly sought-after physician. It wasn't due to his proficiency in diagnosis and surgery, however. Simply put, Marcel Petio was a glorified drug dealer. Anybody who wanted prescription narcotics only needed to pay him a fee, and he would write them the prescription. The profits increased as he drove up the prices of the drugs. The junkies were willing to pay to get their fix, even as their addictions were plunging them irrevocably into the red and straight into bankruptcy. Debtors' prisons were still an option for the insolvent, but when you're addicted to opium, that's the least of your worries. Another legal and profitable venture was abortion. Abortion was illegal, and he processed all procedures off the books, but it lined his pockets handsomely, and in that day and age, many women were keen to sidestep the stigma of being pregnant out of wedlock. Built into the fee was the promise of confidentiality. Another devious form of money grubbing was his tendency to double-dip his billing. He would always ask patients to sign forms that were submitted to the state to pay for their treatment. This after they already paid him. The government's medical assistance fund was set up for people who were injured during the war. Being a doctor with deep pockets rendered Dr. Petio one of the town's most eligible bachelors, and he spent considerable time and effort wooing these local single females. Those women were socially connected and likely virtuous, but when Petio was in the market for a quick fuck, he would take advantage of a female addict who couldn't cover the cost of her fix, kind of like the early 20th century French equivalent of a crack whore. Otherwise, he enjoyed stringing more respectable women along as they entertained fantasies of marrying him and bearing his children. One such woman was Louise Delavaux. When she discovered that she meant little more to him than the occasional roll in the hay, she went directly to his practice to confront him. She was in a rage. She nearly broke the door down when she entered his house and practice. She was never seen after that day. Nobody could trace a straight line to her whereabouts. Days later, her father reported her disappearance to police. They questioned Petio, 
who admitted to his affair with her, but denied knowledge of her ultimate fate. Petiot's neighbors disclosed something interesting they observed the evening of the day she disappeared. They saw Petiot loading a heavy trunk into his car. The practice was closed. He struggled to heft its weight and rejected offers of assistance. The next day, his car had been returned, but the trunk was gone. The police concluded that Louise had run away and closed the case. Her father refused to believe it. 1926. The mayor had resigned, and Marcel Petiot decided to campaign for the position. Getting elected to the head of the municipal government would put him in yet another place where he would have power over others. He had been unpopular with adults as a child, so becoming their mayor would be a form of revenge. During his debate with the other candidate, a man who was paid by Petio to catcall and throw rotten fruit at his opponent managed to rally the rest of the crowd to his cause. They also found Petio's oratorical performance compelling. He won the election. Now that Marcel Petio was both a doctor and a mayor, he decided to reinforce his air of respectability by marrying and having a family. He didn't have to try hard to interest the town's unwedded women, and in spring of 1927, he married Georgette Lablé. Their son, Gerhardt, was born in 1928. The role of father and husband amounted to little more than a facade for Petio. He felt no affection for his son. He cheated on his wife, though he was careful to establish discretion in these pursuits. His love for his wife and child was artificial, and it became obvious to the intuitive. One aspect of his past came back to haunt him. He was still receiving the disability pension, and his eligibility was under review. Psychiatrists were mandated to evaluate his mental health again. Petio responded with a letter that referred to their observations as exhibitionism. He told the government he would rather the payments cease altogether than to experience another demeaning moment under the microscope. The stipend was upheld. At about this time, a trunk was found in a river nearby. Contained within was the corpse of a young woman. Her body was so thoroughly decomposed she could not be identified. The police did not consider that it might be the remains of Louise de Laveau. The police brought it to Petio's attention as a matter of protocol. He did not appear to recognize the trunk or the woman. Marcel Petio was a corrupt politician, using every opportunity to line his pockets. He accepted bribes. He would exploit his position to benefit his business and financial dealings. When he was unable to accept money from his constituents, he would embezzle from the government's coffers. March 1930. The home of Armand de Beauve was burned to the ground while he was away at work. His wife, Henrietta, was unable to escape, and her body was found critically burned. She was beaten savagely with some kind of blunt instrument before the fire started to cover for the fact that the objective of the crime was to kill her. The police speculated that she intercepted the efforts of a burglar. 20,000 francs were stolen before the fire was started. At dawn, a trail of footprints was traced away from the house, through the fields, and all the way to the town of villeneuve sur yon That's where the leads ended. The murderer could have been anybody in town. Marcel Petiot involved himself with the investigation as much as any mayor can, offering to help in any way he could. One promising lead came in the form of a witness. Monsieur Fisco saw a dark-haired man entering and leaving the house frequently during the prior several months. He suspected the man had an affair with her. Neighborhood gossip had it that because her husband was away so often at work, she had taken a lover. She would not divulge the name of the man, but intimated that he was an important man in town. She said he stood to lose everything if their involvement were exposed. She was touched that he was so attracted to her that he would risk his reputation and livelihood just to be with her. Monsieur Fisco went into town to get his medication from Dr. Petio's office. He told his secretary and pretty much everybody in the waiting room about the investigation with which he was involved. 
According to Petiot's records, Monsieur Fisco laid out his health complaints to Petiot and left after they spoke. A few hours after he left the office, he had an aneurysm and died shortly thereafter. Dr. Petio examined him post-mortem and determined that it was the official cause of death. There were details about Monsieur Fisco's visit to Petio's office with which the police were unaware at the time. After finding out about Fisco's involvement in the investigation, Petio offered to give Fisco an injection as part of his treatment for arthritis. It might have been effective had it not been an overdose. Because he was seized by the aneurysm outdoors, it was not considered to be a matter of medical malpractice. Marcel Petiot's corruption was exposed, and he was turfed out of office. Though he was able to turn his defeat into a victory in a future election as an underdog of sorts, his corruption was exposed yet again, and he was purged from the town council for good. He and his family left Villeneuve-sur-Ion in shame. The Petiot family relocated in Paris. He rebuilt his medical practice. He was very popular with his liberal use of the prescription pad and willingness to perform abortions with no questions asked. He advertised his practice, which was frowned upon by the Paris Medical Association. They ordered him to remove his billboard. This did little to affect his popularity as a physician, and he prospered. Dr. Petiot's shady tendencies emerged in other forms. Ever the thief, he knocked a female patient named Raymond Hans unconscious when she sought his care to drain an oral abscess. While she was knocked out, he pilfered all the money from her purse. Whether intentional or not, Petio administered an overdose to Hans. He slapped her in the face a few times to revive her, but to no avail. He brought her out to his car and drove her to her home. He placed her on her bed in hopes that she would sleep it off. She never woke. Her mother found her the next morning. She went to Dr. Petio's office to discuss what had happened to Raymond. He claimed to be baffled by that turn of events. Her mother sought the expertise of other Parisian doctors. When an autopsy was performed, exceedingly high levels of morphine were detected in her blood. They were considered high enough to cause her death. Dr. Petio claimed to have only administered a local anesthetic. No evidence of malpractice was uncovered, so he was not pursued as a suspect. 1935. For the first time, Dr. Marcel Petio was investigated for violations related to narcotics. One of his patients withdrew from his care because for years, Petio kept plying him with addictive drugs so that the francs would continue to pile up. The patient managed to quit his addiction. He wanted to help other people do the same. He took up an activist position. He wanted to shame Dr. Petio and other physicians who were so blithely writing prescriptions for addictive drugs. The journey to sobriety is replete with setbacks, and the man died from the very addiction that had compelled him to campaign against its enablers. His death was ruled a self-inflicted overdose. 1936. Dr. Marcel Petio was appointed to a very prestigious position for a doctor, the Médecin d'État Civil for his district. Translated to English, that meant he became a state doctor. This conferred on Dr. Petio the power and necessity to sign death certificates for anybody that passed away in his borough of Paris. Petio was quick to seize upon this duty as a means to line his pockets even further. Not only was he paid for signing the death certificates, but he would steal things from the home of the deceased. Nobody suspected him because a man in his lofty position was considered too respectable to sink so low. In August of that year, Marcel Petiot was caught stealing, this time by a shopkeeper. He tried to pilfer a book. When a police officer caught up with him and attempted to place him under arrest, he struck the officer knocking him to the ground before fleeing the scene. He went on the lam for two days, but turned himself in with his wife at his side. When he appeared in court, he claimed he could not be considered guilty because of his history with mental illness. He was convincing. He claimed that his latest backslide into insanity 
was the product of his use of a suction machine that was used on the rectum to cure constipation. He said that overuse of the machine undermined his mental stability, and it left him confused at the time he tried to steal the book. He said he was so out of it, he didn't realize the police officer was a man of the law. The court agreed that they would not pursue charges as long as he sought psychiatric treatment. His wife, Georgette, booked Marcel into a privately run sanatorium. Naturally, he felt instantly better and began to discuss his immediate release after only staying one night. He had no problem establishing his credibility with the doctors, being one himself. His internship at a psychiatric hospital had also come in handy. The doctors were not fooled, however. They knew he claimed to be insane to get out of criminal charges. Though it was obvious that he suffered from mental instability, it wasn't a condition that warranted a long-term stay in a psychiatric treatment facility. He was discharged. Eventually, the court came to a similar conclusion, and Petio did not face charges. The court of public opinion could not be so easily swayed. The shoplifting incident and claims of mental illness became widely known, and it sullied both his personal and professional reputation. Knowing the law and the medical establishment were watching him closely, he could not engage in the same underhanded dealings as before. He was reluctant to prescribe or administer any narcotic. He stopped performing abortions. As a result, his income was substantially reduced. Not only had he lost most of his patients, but proving he was mentally well after being evaluated was discovered by the administration of the Disability Pension Office, and they cut off his stipend. He was also charged with tax evasion. He tried to convince the government that it was because of professional expenses, some of which were incurred due to serving an affluent section of town. They didn't buy it. He was fined. Petio resented the government for all this. Eventually, the resentment blistered into rage. June 1940. World War II had begun, and the Germans overtook France. The military commander of Paris declared the metropolis an open city. Soon the government of France had fallen, and the Nazis took over. However, resistance soon took root. Using his contacts to high society and the criminal underworld to his advantage, Marcel Petiot aligned himself with the movement. French soldiers who were wounded from the slave labor to which the Germans subjected them would give Petiot all the information they possessed, and he would pass it on to his underground collaborators. As reward, he would sign a disability certificate, stating they could not return to duty and should be released. Others turned to Dr. Petio, who became known as Dr. Eugene, following the hour of his disgrace, and he became a provider of another service. There were a number of Parisians who were anxious to leave the country. Petio claimed that for a fee of 2,500 francs, he would help smuggle them out of the country. They would also bring luggage containing valuables they didn't want to fall into the possession of the Nazis. Petio told them that after being transported across Portugal, they would set sail for Argentina. He would tell them that they needed to be inoculated, claiming that the government of Argentina was very strict about the health risk involved in accepting refugees. He backed this up by saying the Spanish flu nearly decimated their population. It was no inoculation, not unless you emphasize the injection of cyanide as an anti-life drug. When he was running low on cyanide, he would use homemade digitalis to stop their hearts. Failing that, he would administer a lethal dose of morphine. He threw a few of the dead into the Seine River, but soon realized that he needed to be more discreet to keep his operation going. He dug a pit in his basement and began to fill it with corpses. His brother was supplying him with lime powder to accelerate decomposition. Eventually, he would toss bone and other remainders into an incinerator. Naturally, he kept the bundles of cash, jewelry, and other belongings left behind by those who sought asylum astride the grave. Though the Nazi murder machine was running at full tilt, it became clear to Parisian police that a serial killer was at work in the city. Body parts kept washing up on the Seine. Some of them were dismembered with knives, while others were chewed apart by catfish. The river was trawled, and even more human body parts were found. 
Most of the victims were never identified. Even after nine heads, four thighs, and miscellaneous variety gore, they still could not connect the parts to anyone. Eventually, some identities emerged. Nellie Denise Hotin disappeared after undergoing an abortion at Dr. Petiel's practice. He botched the procedure, and rather than risk being exposed by bringing her to a hospital bleeding profusely, he killed her and disposed of her remains personally. Dr. Paul Leon Bromberger was planning to flee Paris with his wife. She went missing before she could flee at his side. Paul Leon disappeared and only reappeared when he was pulled up from the Seine in a net. The Nellers, a family of three Jewish refugees, were found as a hodgepodge of body parts. They went to Petio to avoid the concentration camps. The Wolf family were also refugees who went to Dr. Eugene to flee occupied Paris. They disappeared one by one. A pimp named Joseph Pierchi and his mistress Josephine Amy Grippe went to Dr. Eugene so Pierchi could flee the country after a warrant for his arrest was issued. He was dismembered and flung into the Seine. None of the body parts found in the Seine comprised an entire human being. Most of their parts were disposed of with fire and lime in the basement of Marcel Patio's practice. The French government was eager to track down the so-called Dr. Eugene, but it did not interest the Gestapo. Nevertheless, French authorities kept their eyes open. They had their work cut out for them. Dr. Eugene's associates were loyal, and, in their eyes, his actions were seen as noble. However, the resolve of such men was broken down after they were tortured by the Gestapo. They all revealed the real name of Dr. Eugene, Marcel Petiot. The Gestapo burst into Marcel Petiot's home and practice in the middle of the day and hauled him away through the streets for the benefit of all onlookers. It solidified his credibility in the eyes of the resistance, since, as far as they were concerned, it was never good to be on the side of the Gestapo. The members of the Gestapo who searched Petio's home did not find the communications equipment they hoped for. It would have been the kind of equipment that would be used to communicate with allies in the resistance. They interrogated Petio with all the usual tactics, but he was not intimidated, and they got nothing. He was prepared for that sort of thing all his life. Nobody who gladly flaunted their authority over him would be satisfied with the outcome. With the Gestapo off their backs, Dr. Petio and the resistance reestablished their network and operations. In the following months, people started dying under suspicious circumstances once again. Some of Petio's associates in the resistance assisted with the dismemberment and disposal of the corpses. They would watch as he cut fingers off to remove valuable rings. They didn't hold him up as a hero so much as they looked upon him as the so-called king of crime. They were fascinated by how he could carry out such acts of barbarity without so much as batting an eyelash. Petio and his family prospered once again, living the life of luxury that had been temporarily suspended following the shoplifting incident. Eventually, people began to suspect that something untoward was afoot. Not only was his family enjoying newfound affluence, but he had guests arriving and departing constantly throughout the day and night. Trucks pulled up, whereupon items were loaded or unloaded. Petio was never around when the trucks arrived, so there was nobody for his neighbors to confront. People of all walks of life darkened his door, and they didn't all appear to be unwell. If this represented the worst of the inconveniences of living next to the Petio family, they would have eventually tuned him out. What couldn't be tuned out were the foul odors emanating from the house. It smelled like the stench of decaying flesh and burning odors. Unpleasant chemical effluvia were also detected. His neighbors wondered if he was running an unlicensed distillery. Police were contacted about the odors on a few occasions but it was not against the law to produce unpleasant smells as long as they didn't pose a health risk to the community. March 6, 1944. Normally oily, black smoke was a fixture at the brim of the chimney on the Petio residence. On this day, that same smoke was pouring forth from some of the upstairs windows. 
Petio was away at the time and provided contact information for his whereabouts. Police called him and told him about the situation. He told them not to enter the house and that he would be there in short order. Before he got there, more smoke was blasting out of the windows. Concerned that a full-blown fire was burning, the police took action. Before long, the fire brigade arrived. They broke through a window on the second story. Moments later, the firefighters burst out the front door. They went straight from there to the garden, where they vomited. When they weren't vomiting, they were coughing or crying. Fire was not enough to produce that reaction in firefighters. They had seen something truly horrific. Police stormed the dwelling to have a look for themselves. What they found was that the smoke emanated from numerous wood-burning stoves. When they looked inside the stoves, they found that it was not wood that was burning. They were stuffed to full capacity with human limbs. One officer tripped over a sack that was left on the floor. He hadn't seen it at first because of the reduced visibility due to the smoke. A head rolled out of the sack. It bounced down to the entrance hall like a basketball. When the police went down to the basement, where the furnace was burning large body parts, they found a pit filled with bodies decomposing under a layer of quicklime. The Parisian police had never encountered so many dead bodies in one location outside of a morgue. There were also several suitcases filled with people's valuables. Another pit was dug in the garage and filled with bodies that were laid out in preparation for the application of quicklime. Some corpses were assembled like it was a factory of corpse production. Jewelry and clothing were stripped from them. Gold fillings were yanked out of their teeth. Rings were cut from fingers. A pile of dismembered bodies was situated in a room near the kitchen, ready to be processed. When Marcel Petiot arrived, he pulled aside the police sergeant and explained that he was a part of the resistance and that the bodies belonged to Nazi agents and collaborators. He claimed to have killed them for political reasons, and they detained him while they began to sort things out. The Gestapo found out about the state of Marcel Petiot's house, and they issued a warrant for his arrest. They also proclaimed him to be a dangerous psychopath who must be stopped. The police let Marcel leave. They acted as if he had never been to the house. When the Gestapo arrived and took charge of the scene, the French police did not object. Once the Gestapo affirmed that none of the dead at the Petio house were among their agents and collaborators, they abandoned the investigation, leaving it in the hands of French police. The police wondered if Marcel Petio might have been in league with the Nazis, since many of the deceased were Jewish. Many of them were not Jewish, which led to more confusion. Drug addicts who bought prescriptions from Petio were also found dead. Jean-Marc Van Bavet confessed in court that Dr. Petio was the source of his drug supply. Marta Kate was not a drug addict, but her son bought prescriptions from Dr. Petio in her name. She admitted that Petio was a source of the scripts. She suddenly disappeared and did not reemerge until she was extracted from a pile of corpses powdered with quicklime. Meanwhile, Georgette Petio was questioned by authorities to determine if she was at all involved in his criminal enterprises. She was truly ignorant of his nefarious dealings. Her perspective on him was nearly hagiographic. She couldn't picture him committing the offenses of which he was accused. Even after he gifted her with endless items of jewelry, including rings that were yanked off severed fingers, she did not suspect that anything untoward was afoot. She assumed that their opulent standard of living was due to his medical career and supplemented with legitimate investments. The notion that the medicine man she was married to had turned their home into a mausoleum was devoid of credibility. The police believed Georgette when she insisted her husband was neither a drug dealer nor a mass murderer. Marcel's brother Maurice was interrogated. Though they couldn't prove he was directly involved in the murders, he admitted that Marcel had been compensating him for delivering several bags of lime powder. 
Some of Petio's assistants from the resistance confessed to their involvement in the murders. Petio had an apartment he lived in part-time. The police went to the apartment. Petio was not only absent, but had deserted the quarters altogether. He didn't take his belongings with him, and neglecting to do so contributed to his downfall. The police found large sums of cash. There was a cache of medical supplies, reportedly more than a typical general practitioner would ever need. This led them to assume that he was a blade runner, an underground dealer of medical supplies. There was so much chloroform on the premises that it exceeded the needs of any private practice. There was a garden outside the apartment in which poisonous plants had been cultivated. One of the most common among them was digitalis, also known as foxglove. The root bulbs of digitalis produce a poison so strong that a small dose is enough to stop a man's heart. The crop of digitalis would have outfitted Petio with enough poison to kill all his patients and more. Now that Marcel Petio was on the lam, he was sheltered and protected by patients and associates in the resistance. France's law enforcement establishment, with additional resources contributed by the Gestapo, made it impossible for Petio to flee the country. To avoid detection, he was smuggled from one house to another among his network of co-conspirators. He settled in the home of Georges Redout. Petio saved his life. He told Redout that the Gestapo was after him for killing Nazis and informers. Petio only left the house late at night and grew a thick beard to partially disguise his appearance. He became involved in various shady dealings to make money. None of them involved narcotics, immigration fraud, and murder, but he consistently ran afoul of the law, nonetheless. While law enforcement and the Gestapo had been unsuccessful in tracking Marcel Petio down, his murder streak did not go unnoticed by the general population. The media made sure of that. Newspapers bestowed upon him such monikers as the Butcher of Paris, the Scalper of Etoile, the Demonic Ogre, and Dr. Satan. Dr. Satan proved to be the most inescapable of all his designations. Eventually, the story received coverage in other European countries and then the world. Others dubbed him the Modern Bluebeard, the Underground Assassin, and the Werewolf of Paris. The crimes were so shocking and horrific that Petio could not even be upstaged by Adolf Hitler. October 31st, the end of the line. Marcel Petio was spotted at a Paris metro station. The sighting was reported to police, and they detained him right before he boarded a train. He did not resist arrest or try to flee. He had been preparing a legal defense to use in the event of prosecution, and, he reasoned, trying to escape would hurt his credibility. When police searched him, they uncovered a pistol, over 30,000 francs, and 50 different falsified identification documents, each bearing his photo with an alias. He assumed that his resistance to Nazi occupation would lead to his acquittal. He believed that his associates in politics would come to his aid and prevent the system from convicting him. He believed this wholeheartedly. So confident was he in the likelihood of this outcome that he confessed to the murders while in jail. He confessed to Victor Massou, the leading investigator, insisting that the murder-related allegations were the product of a misunderstanding. None of Petio's cronies in politics came to his aid. In the past, he used his history with mental illness to avoid the consequences of his crimes, but he chose not to take this tack this time around. According to French law, or at least it was true at the time, an attorney could not submit a plea if the nature of such was contradictory to their client's wishes. Marcel Petio pled patriotism. He claimed that all the victims were traitors that were in cahoots with the Nazis. Simply put, he characterized himself as a hero and the courts as misguided fools. His lawyer petitioned to delay the trial until a time when the public's hatred of Petio abated to some degree. The three presiding judges argued that the public was unlikely to stop hating him, at least not within the subsequent decade. The political implications of his actions aside, 
One assumption was that he killed the victims to pilfer their valuables. The current body count at that time came to 27. This was because many bodies had still not been identified. In many cases, it was because the body parts were severed to the point where not even a head could be found. March 18, 1946. The trial began. Petio was disruptive throughout the trial, shouting out insults and mocking the prosecutors. He even grilled the witnesses from where he sat at the back of the courtroom. His long-suffering lawyer struggled to rein him in as he made a mockery of the proceedings. As the prosecution laid out their arguments for a guilty verdict, Petio accused them of being traitors to France because they were disloyal to him. He made plenty of other remarks in this vein. On the fifth day of the trial, the jurors and judges paid a visit to Petio's home and clinic. It was quite a scene. An enormous posse of police officers were assigned to protect Petio from all the onlookers who demanded justice. His neighbors ordered that he be killed immediately for his crimes. At one point, Petio smiled and quipped, Peculiar homecoming, don't you think? Back at the courtroom, civil lawyers representing the families of individual victims were not spared Petio's acid tongue. For instance, he accused the Kayat family's attorney of being a double agent and a defender of Jews. Those remarks represented the only spit shine on his reputation that improved his reception by the public. When Petio was cross-examined by the prosecutors regarding the murdered victims, he denied having killed them, insisting that they emigrated to Argentina, as did so many others. He did admit to killing 19 of the 27 victims, insisting they were Germans and collaborators. By doing so, he attempted to taint the reputations of people who had already suffered at his hand. He confessed to killing 63 so-called enemies of France. When questioned about the unidentified bodies, he said, I do not have to justify myself for murders I'm not accused of committing. He was arrogant. At one point, while he was asked to comment on the evidence that was being presented by a prosecutor, he was caught doodling. When confronted about this, he said, I am listening, but this doesn't interest me very much. Incredibly, Marcel Petio transformed his reception by the general public. His wit and patriotism won them over, even if it all was secretly a sham. Far less amused were the jury. They saw the crime scene photos and were so disturbed by what they saw that they were scarred for life. They even had nightmares and suffered from post-traumatic stress. As far as they were concerned, there was nothing to laugh about. After deliberations, the jury acquitted Marcel Petio on nine of the 135 counts due to insufficient evidence. For the rest, he was found guilty. The heftiest of the charges were the 26 counts of premeditated murder. He was sentenced to death. He filed an appeal, but it was rejected. May 25, 1946. Marcel Petio was beheaded by guillotine. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.